will get on. Okay, if you can hear me, I can hear you very well. Yeah? Yes, I can, yeah. Okay, great. Okay, well, uh, look, uh, thanks for taking the time anyway. Um, uh, I was really uh, quite excited to see that there's going to be uh, something new coming from um, the Nick Drake estate because it's, you know, I've been a, a big fan for a long time and I read a biography as well, so this is... Um, this is a real, uh, really exciting news for me. Uh, what can you tell me about the book? What's uh, what's going to be new? What what can um, what can we expect to find in it? Well, it's not a biography. I, 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 I should start by saying what it's not. The mm -hmm. book is not a biography, and we've always intended never to to try and attempt such a thing. Not even with the information and the data that. Has because a family never threw anything away. Every bill, receipt, note, diary, everything uh, was kept on, on all the family members, on, on Rodney Drake and Molly Drake. I don't think there was anything other than then coming from a, a, uh, an era where everything was precious. Um, and then having moved from abroad and coming to the UK and having enough room just to judiciously file everything. Rodney was a fairly important engineer in, in the Birmingham industry. Right. And so the, everything was on paper and everything appeared to have been kept. Right, uh, okay. But going through it, you know, you, one realises how, what, 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 a, what a, a folly even attempting to try and write something called a biography would be about somebody like Nick. Right. Um, because there are so many different facets and so many different people sort of appear to know quite a different person. Right, okay. That it, it um, and this is common, I think, not just with Nick, but with a lot of musicians and a lot of artists. And so you end up reading a biography that's fairly hollow. And, and in my opinion, the, the, the biographies that have been written about Nick, which are number about four or five, say more about the writer than they do about me. Wow. That seems to be the, the, the obvious um, outcome is that when you try and pin down something that is not easy to pin down, you tend to pin yourself down far earlier than, than the subject that you're writing about. But we wanted, we had a, a, a lot of material to hand and I was keen on there being a book about Nick's songs. Right. Um, and we had managed to stop some books that were published that were just the usual cheap um, sort of Nick Drake songs by almost like by Bouncing Ball, by here are, here are the chords and here are the lyrics. The ones, they were music books and they were incredibly inaccurate. The lyrics were wrong. The chord structures were all completely wrong. Yeah. And, and I had a lot of people writing in to me saying, how can you write this rubbish? <laughs> because I've tried to play it and it's all wrong. Yeah. And, and I thought, well, you know, we didn't write it and it was nothing. To, they, were, they were done completely without our knowledge or approval. That's interesting. They would have to come to you surely, though, for, for copyright, I'd imagine, before they could actually um, print something like the chord structures or the chords themselves. No, Nick's publishing. Um, right. uh, the, the song publishing has always been assigned. Is that Island Records, is it? No, no, that was to Warlock Music. Oh, sorry. Which then got sold and got bought by Ryko Disc. That then got sold and got bought by Evergreen. Then got sold and is now owned by BMG. So within the publishing deal, there'll be a clause that says that the publisher will look after pretty cheap music. Mm. Um, and that wasn't something that at the time when the deals were done, anybody had any concern for. Um, uh, as it turned out, you know, the, 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 the deals were done, but the, in practice, the company that puts the books out are so slapdash. Yeah. They had no interest in the sheet music being accurate. They just give it to a jobbing um, musician to sort of basically try and get it yeah. right. And I wanted to rectify this. And the, the more I looked at trying to transpose the songs, the more difficult it got because although there are songs recorded when I was going through the lyrics the lyrics change from Nick's original handwritten lyrics through to Nick's typed lyrics that he'd take into the studio through to the lyrics that actually got sung. Mm. So you found find again
again, as with the biography, there are several strata of uh-huh. forms of lyrics. Oh, that's interesting. And, and, and that's often the case with musicians, is that they're revising and revising, and even when they've recorded the song and they go out and play the song live, they can throw in extra verses or change arrangements and stuff. Yeah. And I like the fact that music is, when, 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 uh, when it's fluid like that, is extremely interesting. So we abandoned the idea of doing any kind of music book, but the book started to evolve into it being like a 1930s companion, where when books were selling well in the 1930s, um, my, well, my parents had a companion to Beethoven. Okay. It was a really nice, lavish book, and it came with two albums, mm. two vinyl albums, uh, and, and, it, and it had a lot of stories and a lot of different things about Beethoven, but it, and there was a biography in it as well. Mm. But it was really designed for people, if, you, like you're, in, if you're into Beethoven, you may enjoy this book, not as a definitive study of Beethoven, because there are many of those, mm. more like something that you would just take on the journey of listening to Beethoven's music. And I found that there were many of these, and companion to birds, companion to engineering, you know. So I thought, well, this might be a better bracket to, to, to classify our, our book as. Right. It's not definitive in any way at all. Okay. It's not um, the first or the last word in Nick Drake. It's just a collection of writings, some of which already existed, which we liked, which was a shame that they had appeared in magazines and then the magazine disappears and there's no way of reading them. Right. Um, for example, Ian McDonald's piece on Nick, I think, is a landmark piece of writing and or it was in Mojo magazine and then appeared in one of his compendiums. But a lot of people don't know about it and a lot of people don't want to buy a book just to read that one section sure. of Nick. So we gathered together some of those writings that we liked. And, and then at the same time, when I met Chris Healy, who's a very accomplished guitarist, who has been working on Nick's um, tabulations for many, many years, mm. he he writes what I think are beautiful descriptions on what he feels as a guitarist Nick was attempting to do by the way that the guitar was played. It doesn't explain the song, and it doesn't even say this is the definitive tuning or this is the definitive finger pattern. Chris is saying, this is how I would perform yeah. this song. Right, that's and interesting. And we recordings of, Nick, of Nick's songs as, a, as acoustic, solo acoustic pieces. I thought they were just really beautiful and that this was a good addition to the book to have a fellow guitarist, accomplished guitarist, just write a description of how he would attempt to yeah. um, phrase the pieces. And that's about as close as a plain description as anyone's going to get, and then there are the lyrics and in their different forms, and there are missing verses, and then there's a whole load of what we assume are songs because they were in Nick's songbook right. that never became recorded pieces or finished pieces. What are they? Uh, um, if you don't mind me asking, are they just the um, the, the lyrics? Are they the composition, or are they, are they written for? Yeah. yeah, okay. Just lyrics, because there was a fourth album in preparation. That's right. And Nick had recorded five of those songs in order of them, them appearing on the. You know, he had the running order all worked out. Mm-hmm. But the other five songs, we only have the lyrics for because wow. they're the only things that survived. And wow. it may be that Nick never even recorded the um, the melodies. Um, just going back to the the guitarist you were talking about there briefly, um, the Chris Healy, I, was, I just got on the back of watching a Nick Drake um, documentary on YouTube called Under the Review, um, and there was a guy on there that was um, covering some of the songs and talking his way through the songs. Is that the same guy? Uh, no. no, different. Okay, I mean uh, they must be quite few and far between though. The people that can actually duplicate or have even a get close to the Nick Drake songs because of all the tunings that um, he would implement in the songs and uh, the even the you know the time signatures like Riverman's in five four for example. Um, you know and the tunings all over the place as well. So there must be people that it, it would take a really dedicated person to work it out. <laughs> is what I'm getting at. I, I think some people approach it as a sport. Right. And and so they they manage to conquer cello song, for example, and then they'll put it up on YouTube. And there's many many pieces on YouTube where people you just see the hands playing the guitar, and, mm. and it is like a sport. And it's not just reserved for Nick. There's the same on Stefan Grappelli. There's the same on many accomplished. Uh, 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 John Martin, who was I think a, a guitarist of equal accomplishment. Mm. Um, that's a big. There's a big difference between being able to do the, the song and then someone being able to interpret the song and make it their own. 
Yeah. And, and for me, the, the, the cover versions of Nick songs that work are often the ones that are far away from Nick's recordings of his own songs. Oh, okay. So they either skip a genre, they go into a, a jazz genre or a country genre, mm. and often, you know, they're sung by, they're either instrumentals or they're sung by a woman, and it just takes it away from someone trying to be Nick Drake. Yeah, because I mean, that's probably going to be the hardest thing to ever do anyway, is to imitate it or replicate it as it was on the record. Um, so if you do just maybe take an idea from it and make it your own, then the, it will be the interpretation that will be better rather than the actual um, song itself, if you see what I mean. Um, they, they, they for me, are the ones that the song comes alive and then Nick is, is left behind. Yeah. Um, but you know, a lot of people are daunted because they love Nick's music so much. Mm. So um, they falter because they just think, well, there's nothing. That, there have been people who, who I think are, are great musicians who started to do a cover version of a Nick song and just thought, we can't better it and we can't take it anywhere else and we would rather just leave it with Nick. Sure. And then there are other musicians who have never heard of Nick Drake, but their producer has said, why don't you try this song? And they just sing it as a song and they tend to be quite successful cover kind of versions. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. I mean, I was um, uh, I was thinking maybe the, the third album, whilst we're talking about covers, the Pink Moon, I'm guessing most people would perhaps have a bash at doing some of those songs because they're, you know, they're very underproduced. Maybe they, you know, they could perhaps take the song and add instrumentation to them and make it their own. Is it, do you find it's the songs from the third album that people attempt more? Ah, okay. Actually, uh, there aren't that many versions that I know of, of songs from Pink Moon. I don't know why that is. Uh, Five Leaves Left gets a lot of covers. Mm. Um, but no, uh, and it's an interesting, it would be an interesting exercise to say from the morning and orchestrate it. Yeah, I mean, I, I I can't imagine anyone hasn't tried it already to, you know, maybe perhaps fill in the gaps they feel are there that aren't there in the production. Like, I mean, Brighter later had, you know, quite a, an exaggerated production, if you, you know, if you can call it that. It was it was had lots of colour and lots of orchestration, whereas uh, Pink Moon was very stripped back, wasn't it? In that sense, it, it may be because there is a kind of a, a received wisdom that says Nick didn't like the arrangements on the first two albums, and that's why he recorded Pink Moon in the way that he did. Mm. But we have enough in our notes and diaries to show that Nick was incredibly pleased with Brighter Later and the way that it came out. But said afterwards, okay, I've done that now and the next album is not going to be like that. Yeah. And at the time, and people forget about the era, there were a lot of musicians, including John Lennon, for example, and we have a good account of Nick here in John's first solo album and being quite shocked at how sparse and raw that album is. Mm. And I think that that was, a, with certain musicians, that was a sign of the times. And Nick even sang, you know, you can take the road, it'll take you to the stars, I'll take the road, that'll see me through. And I think Pink Moon, in its simplicity, is possible, and it sounds pretentious, but I find it one of the most complex and deep albums because of its, its, um, because of the fact that some of the songs have only got four lines sung, mm. four, you know, four written pieces of lyric for them. So they are like a lot of meditative pieces. They require, they leave a lot more room for people to interpret. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I I was getting that feeling listening to um, Pink Moon myself and listening to other people talk about the songs. Um, uh, just uh, just briefly, Kelly, I, I, I don't want to keep you too long, but I just wanted to get a couple of ideas about, um, if you don't mind, about you and the estate and how uh, uh, how, how your general nine-to-five is. I mean, I, I read recently that Pink Moon was um, on the Volkswagen ad, I think, wasn't it? It was, it was then that... Well, I, I worked at Ireland, of course, for ten years. Sorry. And, and Ireland yeah. had a number of artists that I thought were criminally undersold. Hmm. And Chris Blackwell, who ran Island Records, was a staunch believer in one day people will discover how good this music is and all we have to do is keep it in stock yeah. and people will come round to it. And I had to say to him, well, it does actually require a bit of marketing sometimes. 
Which he didn't really get. Which he didn't really get in his day, did he? They were saying that he was marketed very poorly, Nick Drake. He, you know, he wasn't pitched to the right people. He wasn't, you know. Uh, right, I, hope the, I hope the book sets that that myth right as well. Oh really? Okay. They placed a lot of advertising for Nick. They did a lot of promotion on Nick. Um, you know, he was he was a very Have you been approached since by um, other advertising companies, you know, to, to cherry pick the songs? Is there a, or films, you know, I imagine... Oh yes, yeah. Yeah, there's been a lot, I think, have been uh, quite successful, really, you know, Garden State and the World Ten About. There, there are just directors who are probably of a similar age to me, who were brought up listening to Nick Drake, and their revenge on the world is, is to be able to put Nick into yeah. the film. Yeah. 
mm. and hearing a piece of music and wondering what it is yeah. and not caring so much about the musician, although we hope obviously that they fall in love with Nick and it becomes a, a great thing for them. Mm-hmm. But it starts with the song. It starts with someone hearing Northern Sky and being moved by it and then, and then them wanting to know more about who it was that wrote the song or performed it. And does it um, kind of hinge on if someone does approach you and say, "Look, I'd love to use this song in this advert or in this film," um, is the next question, uh, the next conversation about, well, how good is it? How good is the material that it's going to be accompanying? So, would you take a look at the advert or take a yeah. look at the piece and the film? Is it along them lines? Yeah, so yeah. We don't have any barriers. Sure. We don't have any. You know, if an arms industry came to us, it would have to be a pretty, pretty um, tall order for us to want to be involved in it and in particular subjects but we never say no I mean McDonald's approached us and we said well let's see the advert and they didn't show us the advert so really wow yeah because I mean they probably just thought well you're going to hate the advert so <laughs> yeah and, and, although we have ethics yeah and and a lot of our decisions are ethical I would never turn anything down per se just because it happened to be a bank sure just because it happened to be you know, a, a, a product that initially you'd think, well, that's not a very good thing to support. But uh, but we, we turned down, well, I think I worked out we approve about one in six. Wow, okay. So, and, and there are about maybe six a month come to us, um, uh, appeals for use in Nick's music. So some fans get a bit uppity about where they hear Nick's music because it's very, it is very precious to people, it's very precious to me. Mm. But, uh, what they don't get to hear about are the the other five sure. that got turned down. Well, um. I mean, there's, I was, when I was just watching it, I mean, when I read the book and when I um, watched the review and I've been listening to the songs. How how he how Nick didn't really um, get received, or he wasn't, you know, he wasn't a massive figure in his day. Does that kind of anger you in any way, like the reviews he got from Melody Maker, from people that perhaps should have known better at the time to no, give this guy a bit? No. I've got a, a large record collection, and I've got so many artists that I think, in their day, why were they not, why were they not uh, appreciated more? Hmm. Jeff Buckley, and uh, Tim Buckley is, not Jeff, Tim Buckley is a very, uh, or David Ackles, you know, David Ackles died pretty unknown, he's still unknown. I think it's, he's criminally overlooked, but but that's just the nature of the game. He probably just didn't play the game enough to be to be. I mean, he's highly highly regarded by other uh, songwriters, but he's not a household name. Mm. And Nick was there were quite a few on Island. Claire Hamill sold even fewer albums than Nick, and she put out as many as Nick. And she was on Island, and Island. Um, carried on with her all the time because they just felt that she's got something to say that was worth saying. Mm. But some people, sometimes luck plays a bit of, you know, you, you can, we can all do with a bit of luck. Yeah, uh, well, especially in the, yeah. Uh, sorry. Consistency and, 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 and keeping a high quality up. It took Tom, Tom waits a long time to start selling a lot of records himself, but he was selling songs to other um, artists. Uh, beforehand because people recognise the quality in his songwriting. Sure, sure. Um, look, uh, Kelly, I could talk to you all night. I'm sure you've got better things to do than talk to me uh, about. I mean, that was really, really insightful. Um, I'm going to put all this um, collectively when... I mean, I emailed um, the person you were talking to about the book, but then I realised that there can't be that many copies. I think you said there's only going to be about a thousand books printed. So I didn't want to take a book, you know, just for yeah, myself. The, the, the thousand copies is the and it comes in a box. There, there is an unlimited edition which is the same contents, it's just in a different binding, it's just a, a, a normal hardback, um, printed hardback binding, which is, you know, it's going to be £30 and available forever, I hope, on, on Amazon. And, mm-hmm. uh, we, we, because, because both Gabriel and I have a very um, particular view on how powerful books can be and there is no need for books to be cheap yeah. 
mm -hmm. which puts it Peter Cassidy's at Dull and they can read it on their Kindle and, and if people just want to give a book that's around about thirty pounds for a present, there's an addition for them as well. Sure. Well, look, uh, I put the request in to get a book, so hopefully I'll have something uh, to accompany the interview with. Uh, if not, then um, I'll source it out. I think um, someone said they could send me a PDF of it. Either way, uh, I'll look forward to reading it and seeing it when I get it yeah. in my hands. Um, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll send you all the links once I've, I've put it all up and um, I press, I'll backlink it all. Would you like me to backlink um, to the site, to the estate, or to... Is there anything you want me to plug especially? Right. They could spill off into other areas. Great. Um, and look, just lastly, for my own my own curiosity, um, Kelly, do you think there'll ever be a film about Nick Drake? Well, there'll never be. They, there will never be a film where Nick is portrayed as an act by an actor. Mm -hmm. Nick is an actor. He's not a character. One a month. Right. Everybody has their own idea of who Nick was, and we're not about to start spoiling that by saying, he was an actor playing the part of Nick Drake. And also, as people, I think, will realise when they look at our book, Nick's life was not spectacular. Mm. And to make a film about somebody, it's very hard to say, well, here's a film about, about someone's life, and it's, <coughs> it's not very spectacular. So by the very medium, they'd have to enhance or make stuff up or add to it so I don't want to ruin anyone's I don't want actually my idea of who Nick was and who Nick still is I don't want it pinned down to being well here is you know an actor playing the part and trying to recreate the, the times it's a very easy yeah. thing for us to just keep saying no to every time despite you know the, the very um, flattering approaches and the, and the standard of directors and producers and people that say we'd do anything you want to. I think people feel that there's money to be made in a biopic about Nick Drake and I think mm. there's, month, there's magic to be lost yeah. in making a biopic and that to me is, is far more important than not to lose the magic. Well, it's the very magic that Nick sings about in mm. I Was Made to Love Magic so <laughs> it would be a betrayal of sorts. Yeah, I mean well, even just talking to you about the other books, the ones that I've read and the myths that you've corrected and stuff like that, you would, you you could easily have a film that would take some of those books and you know take them as gospel, and they wouldn't be true at all. You know, some of the things. Not true, but you know, to sell a book, you also perhaps have got to look people in the eye and say, "Look, this is the truth." Right. That was that was actually right at the forefront of my mind. <laughs> well, it never happened, and you know, the person responsible for the island said that never happened. Right. But it, it's a bit like why let why let facts and events ruin right. a good story? And, and I think, well, yeah, good luck to you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, um, Callie, thanks a lot. I mean, I've taken up half an hour, so thanks. Um, you know, that was really, really uh, interesting. And like I say, I could talk to you all night, but you've got, you've got other stuff to do. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll definitely get this over to you, and uh, and I look forward to getting the book uh, and reading it and seeing it. Okay. Yeah, and, right. and best of luck with it. Cheers. Thank you, Callie. Cheers. Take care. Bye bye.